All right, so uh, my name is Paul Regensberger. I worked as an undergraduate on this research project with Paul Bernanal. Uh, so we looked at the geology of the rocky interiors inside the icy satellites in Celsius, Ganymede, Titan, Europa. Uh, so we all know that ice satellites have a rough structure of a rocky interior, uh, liquid water ocean, and ice shell. The geology of the ice shell has been fairly well characterized over the years thanks to observation. It's easy to say stuff about it because we can see it. But the rock water interface, uh, we don't really know because we can't see it. So we really wanted to take a look and use rock mechanics perspective to say what is going on down there. And because this talk is based on working our way up from the rock up into the ocean, we started with our very first talk today, the rock itself. So our goal was to thank you uh, predict what the ocean floors might look like. So we wanted to look at like our hydrothermal vents possible, and our focus really was on faulting fractures. So these are breaks in the rock, and we wanted to see if we could actually generate faults on these bodies. Uh, so we looked at how we could generate these faults with a focus on looking at diurnal tidal stress. And we also looked at radial contraction. But first, we wanted to look at how to actually measure fault strength. So starting with Enceladus, we did a numerical profile. Uh, so we used a three-layer structure with a silicon interior radius of about 191 kilometers, uh, ocean depth of about 11.5 kilometers, and ice shell thickness of 50.5 kilometers. Now, these are not uniquely determined. We didn't go and do uh, spin dynamics and stuff to determine these values. Uh, but these are internally consistent with the radius of the body. Uh, and we use these as rough estimate to see what the structure might look like. So the first part of our calculation was gravity. In order to find the overburden stress, we start with the gravitational acceleration. It's a very simple equation. We used uh, a fourth order runge kind of method for evaluating our differential equations. And then using gravity, we were able to calculate the overburn stress throughout the body. The next up part was that we calculated the porosity of the rocky interior. We used uh, two values of the void space fraction at the surface of the rock. We used a V naught equals 0 0.1 and V naught equals 0 0.4. So 40% void naught, void space fraction, and 10%. Uh, we found that these did not really have a very large effect on weakening the rock too much. So we tend to just stick with a V naught of 0 0.1 because that would generate the weakest possible scenario. Moved on to our normal and reverse faulting. Uh, we wanted to see what kind of breaks can actually occur. So here we have our equations. We assumed that the overburden stress was the vertical stress. And we wanted to find the horizontal stress required to, to get normal faulting and reverse faulting. Uh, we use our porosity values to determine pore fluid pressure. And we use two coefficients of friction, as seen down here, for wet and dry rock. We used a uh, mu equals 0 0.3 for wet altered rock. Reason being that it's wet, it's altered, and it has lower co coefficient of friction. Uh, and for dry rock, we use a value of 0 0.6. And we found that normal faulting is weaker for dry rock, and reverse faulting is weaker for wet rock. But first, we want to look at just graphing stuff. So here we have our hydrostat. Uh, ignore this up there, that's just for your reference. But here we have the hydrostatic pressure from fluids. Uh, it is linear through space, but we have a log scale up here for fault strength, so that's why it's curved. Next up, we have the lithostatic pressure, which is the overburn stress we calculated. Here we have the stress required to generate a normal fault, and the stress required to generate a thrust fault. So the minimum stress for a normal faulting in uh, Enceladus is about 2.7 megapascals of stress. And for the minimum stress for thrust faulting, in wet rock, which is the weakest, for thrust faulting, we found a value of about 13 megapascals. Currently, we found that present-day diurnal tidal stress on the ocean floor only generates about 800 pascals of stress. So that tells us that we aren't seeing any normal or thrust faulting from tidal stress. Additionally, we wanted to look at radial contraction. Radial contraction is a method that the interior is actually uh, decreasing its radius, and that can generate thrust faulting. Uh, in order to generate uh, the 13 megapascals needed for a thrust fault on Enceladus, the radius we need to have decreased by about 14 meters. So then we wanted to go and step up our calculations and do something much more complicated than Enceladus. So we did Ganymede. Uh, this is just rough numbers for uh, silicate and iron core. Total radius is 17 
24 kilometers, and a total hydrosphere of about 910 kilometers. We roughly approximated these to an iron core layer, a rock mantle layer, a high pressure ice layer, and a liquid water and ice 1H shell. Uh, but we really were interested in the rock itself, so we only needed the density uh, and mass approximations for the hydrosphere. So we didn't worry about the layers of different high phase uh, ices. So here we have our, high, our fault strength profiles. Again, normal faulting is the weakest. We have a little static overburden stress. We have our thrust fault. We also wanted to estimate the duct strength of the ductile portion side Ganymede. So here we have our ductile strength uh, equation. Uh, we used for our material a Maryland diabase as our uh, first approximation. Uh, this was seemed to be a decent approximation at first. Uh, we also looked at uh, using wet olivine, but wet olivine would uh, increase the brittle ductile transition we would find uh, since it has a higher activation energy. Uh, the weakest part of our equation is definitely our temperature profiles. Uh, we do assume uh, radiogenic heating and get uh, geotherms for those, but that's our weakest approximation for right now. For our strain rate, strain rate we used two values. We used a high strain rate value of 10 to the minus 14th per second, and a low strain rate of 10 to the minus 20th per second. We wanted to look at these so that we could find the brittle ductile transition. That's the point where basically uh, the strength fault curves and the ductile flow curves intersect. That tells us that everything above this point will behave brittly and deform brittly. Everything below that will deform ductilely. So, for Ganymede, our minimum brittle ductile transition is for dry rock, and it's about 510 kilometers in depth. Now, this is insanely de deep, and for reference, here on Earth, the BDT is about 15 kilometers. Uh, the minimum stress for normal faulting on, on Ganymede is 560 megapascals, and diurnal tidal stress only generates about 930 pascals. In order to overcome the 3.2 gigapascals of stress need for a thrust fault, you would need to decrease the radius of the silica interior by 33 kilometers. Uh, next, we look at Titan. We have our values for our silica interior, high pressure ice layer, an ocean, and ice shell. And our fault strength profiles, again, normal fault, lithostatic, and thrust fault. And we found that the minimum stress for normal faulting is about 285 megapascals, but present day diurnal tidal stress only generates about 3.8 kilopascals. And again, for thrust faulting, to overcome the 1.6 gigapascals of uh, thrust faulting stress you need, the radius we need to decrease by about 20 kilometers. Now you note that these are about half the values of the stresses we found for Ganymede. Uh, Ganymede had a thrust fault stress for about 3.2 gigapascals, here, 1.6 gigapascals. We did not find a brittle ductile transition point at all in Gan uh, Titan. Uh, that is likely due to our geotherm being much colder than it is on uh, Ganymede. Uh, so it's entirely possible that it is brittle all the way to the core. And finally, we ended with Europa. Uh, another simple model like Enceladus, three layers, uh, a silicate interior, a liquid water ocean, and the ice shell. Here we have our thrust fault, our fault strength profiles, and our ductile profiles. And so in order to overcome the five, uh, 276 megapascals for a thrust fault, the radius we need to de decrease by about 2.4 kilometers. And in order to, uh, the present day tidal, tidal stress of 20 kilopascals will not overcome the minimum normal faulting stress of 51 megapascals. We found a brittle ductile transition depth of 145 kilometers approximately. That is again an order of magnitude larger than it is here on Earth. So we did this as a numerical profile. It's a numerical code. It can be easily applied to other bodies. All you need is a rough estimate of the interior structure. So we can take bodies like Ganymede and look at their strength profiles for the interior and compare them to other silicate bodies throughout the solar system. The Moon, Earth, Mars, any body you want. You can also compare between the LAC satellites and look at uh, all these different rocky bodies we now can look at. So in conclusion, we found that the rocky portion of the cell may be porous to the core, but ductile deformation is not going to occur. It's most likely entirely brittle. There's negligible porosity in the tiers of Europa, Titan, and Ganymede after less than a kilometer. 
The minimum BDT depth in Europa is no shallower than 145 kilometers, but it's much deeper, over 500 kilometers in Ganymede. And stresses from both diurnal tile, tile stress and global contraction appear insufficient to drive faulting on any of these four bodies. So really, the prospect of little to no fracturing is really interesting because that means that there's a limit to which seawater can percolate down into the depths, and there was no large-scale fractures to, to forward the water to enter. Uh, it is possible that we could see magma ascending to the ocean floor, but it is certainly going to be impeded by the lack of faults. Uh, it's not to say that there is not fracturing in the microscale, but the large-scale faulting we would see like we do here on Earth is not going to be seen. Uh, so thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. I believe we have time for questions. What's that? How will this affect the <laughs> Paul, uh, yeah, fantastic presentation. Really nice work and, and very um, uh, clearly presented, uh, which uh, uh, not being a special in this, I, I appreciate. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, uh, as you said, you can adapt this to, to any world. Mm -hmm. I would love to see you adapt this to a made-up world. Uh, in particular, right. what do you think would happen if you took Io and all the parameters of Io, put an ocean and ice over Io? Just <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I have played with the idea of doing made-up worlds. It's certainly something I've been interested in doing. Uh, but I was just a poor undergrad student doing what my advisor told me for the first part <laughs> of the project. Uh, but I was going forward, I'm also just another physicist, so I can just like, hey, I can just make up any world I want. So I could do IO and add a theoretical uh, hydrosphere on top of it. Yeah. Uh, that's really something interesting, and I'll want to look into that. Cool. Nice work. Right. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think Steve Vance had a paper in 2007 that uh, he looked at thermal cracking. Uh, and I believe on Europa, he had a depth of thermal, possible thermal cracking up to 25 kilometers. Uh, so there is certainly other possibilities for uh, fractures to exist. But for like large scale uh, faulting, we're not going to see that as of right now. Um, so somewhat responding to Kevin's question about uh, making up a world by looking at IO, I should point out that these, in, these interior profiles are sort of made up in the sense that we assume a specific heat profile uh, and our composition, our, our choice of having a core, for example, in the case of Europa, where that's sort of an option, um, determines those depths and determines the material properties. So we could make up an IO by, uh, by pumping up the heat flow uh, for Europa, for example. Uh, a, a problem that we have currently with the way that I'm running these models is that I can't treat very high heat flow because I don't want to create melts. And so actually Mohit, Malwani, Daswani, and I are working on doing that now. When you apply it to Earth? When we apply it to Earth? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I haven't done that. Uh, but we would basically have to remove layers, and we just have a tiny, tiny uh, water layer compared to most of these other worlds. Uh, so there, I have to look into that. All right, I'm going to move on. Thank you, Paul.